Say something. Hello, Hi. hello. <laughs> Wait for the right team. One minute. talk about organophosphate poisoning. The irony is that I have never seen organic phosphate, uh, organophosphate poisoning um, in my career. So I should not be teaching you all. You all should be teaching me, but it is what it is. So I want to for sure hear about your cases that you've seen uh, like at the end and it, feel free to interrupt me if anything I say is not true in practice. Um, because this whole lecture is based on my reading and, you know, evidence and stuff like that. But, it, but as we know, patients don't read the textbooks, so they could present very differently. And so you all will have to teach me what that looks like, okay? All right. So we're going to talk about uh, background of organophosphate poisoning, pathophysiology, patient presentation, diagnosis, treatment, and disposition. So the background... Organophosphates are human-made chemicals that poison insects and mammals. They are the most widely used insecticides today. They're colorless, odorless, have low volatility and high lipophilicity, um, and they're highly lipid soluble so they can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is why we see central nervous system symptoms. They can be absorbed through the skin, gastrointestinal route, or inhaled by respiratory route. There are over 100 insecticides that produce cholinergic effects, and they are either classified as organophosphates or carbamates. It's not really super important to us which one it is. The only difference is that um, organophosphates bind to acetylcholinesterase irreversibly, whereas carbamates bind reversibly. So theoretically, that leads to decreased duration and severity of symptoms. Um, so 750,000 of 3 million people are deliberately or accidentally poisoned by organophosphate and carbamate chemicals every year, and an estimated 300,000 deaths occur. The fatality rate is very high from 15 to 50 percent, even with uh, really good ICU level care, and usually people die from respiratory failure. The WHO interestingly lists uh, pesticide poisoning as the single most common method of suicide worldwide, which I was very shocked about, uh, but apparently like 20% of suicides are due to insecticide poisoning. So what is our pathophysiology? Um, so it all has to do with acetylcholine. So normally acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter released from um, autonomic ganglia, sympathetic, it has sympathetic effects and parasympathetic effects, and it also works in neuromuscular junctions. Um, I think that's important to touch on because I, when I think of acetylcholine, I think of it as a parasympathetic neurotransmitter, but it actually does affect both our sympathetic systems and our parasympathetic systems, depending on what receptor it's hitting. So it hits nicotinic and muscarinic receptors, um, and those are located in basically all over our body. Under normal conditions, the acetylcholine that is in our synaptic cleft is then degraded by acetylcholinesterase, which then stops the nerve impulse from occurring. Maybe I should move diet to the upper corner. Let's see. So basically the enzyme acetylcholinesterase breaking down the acetylcholine. 
Um, so this just shows is like a picture showing that it acts on two different receptors, muscarinic receptors and nicotinic. And based on which one it hits depends on what symptoms it causes. Um, so muscarinic, you can see on the left side of the screen, and that's where you get your classic like sludge symptoms, dumbbell symptoms, and the killer bees, which we'll touch on. And then the other side of the screen is our nicotinic symptoms. And that's where you get your um, symptoms that I really don't think of when I think of cholinergic toxicity, like get hypertension, um, you get release of epinephrine from your adrenal medulla, and you get like CNS stimulation. Interestingly, what I read was that in pediatric patients, when they have cholinergic toxicity, they usually have more nicotinic symptoms compared to adults who usually have more muscarinic symptoms. So here is again, all the symptoms you can see. Um, that goes wrong with organophosphate poisoning. So organo, um, so here's our like the green monster is our acetylcholinesterase enzyme that's supposed to be breaking down the acetylcholine and our monster, the organophosphate um, binds to the acetylcholinesterase enzyme and it inhibits it. Therefore, you get a ton of acetylcholine that's attacking all these muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Um, and when these are stimulated for a really long time, you eventually get blockade of synaptic transmission, which is why eventually you see paralysis. So here are the symptoms in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system that we see with cholinergic toxicity. So CNS symptoms, we can see headache, confusion, vertigo, seizures, and coma. Our muscarinic uh, receptors, when those are hit, we get our classic sludge symptoms uh, or dumbbells is another mnemonic. So salivation, lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, GI pain, emesis, meiosis. Uh, diaphoresis, so everything is very runny and lots of liquid. When our nicotinic receptors are hit, we get the mnemonic the days of the week, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or midriasis, muscle cramps, tachycardia, twitching. Basically, I think of the nicotinic symptoms as like what happens when you give someone succinylcholine, when you paralyze them, you see like those muscle fasciculations, and because they're having so much muscle stimulation and contractions, and then they become paralyzed. So that's nicotinic. And the common causes of death in organophosphate toxicity is uh, the killer bees, bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm. So here's that depicted in an image, if you like images better, um, sludge for the muscarinic and then nicotinic are the days of the week. It's important to remember our differential diagnoses, other things that can cause the sludge symptoms. Um, so like mushrooms, uh, nerve agents, which are also sort of organophosphates, uh, nicotine toxicity, and then also maybe someone has myasthenia gravis and they took a ton of their medication. Then there's this concept called aging, and we don't need to know all like the chemistry and everything, but basically organophosphates bind to acetylcholinesterase and they cause this like bond to occur, which makes um, over time, it makes that acetylcholinesterase enzyme stuck. It's like stuck inhibited. And so it's important when we talk about medications and how to treat these patients, because we want to give them the medications before aging occurs. The speed of which aging occurs depends on what type of insecticide they were poisoned by. So how do patients present? Um, so there are three distinct poisoning periods that we see in patients with cholinergic toxicity. Those are the acute cholinergic syndrome, the intermediate syndrome, and the organophosphate in delayed polyneuropathy. The acute cholinergic syndrome is everything that we think of when we think of cholinergic toxicity. So like we've already talked about the sludge symptoms and the days of the week symptoms and the killer bees. So these are our really sick people that just got exposed and they are um, very runny and have lots of secretions and everything like that. 
so sludge i had to i was thinking like what <coughs> i knew sludge was an english word but i had to think of what sludge was i was like um uh, mud yeah and then our dumbbells and then next we have intermediate syndrome. So this happens one four days after they were exposed to a cholinergic um, thing. It happens in 20% of patients after they had an oral exposure. And it's not really clear what type of insecticide causes it, no, um, association. These patients are gonna come in and they are going to have weakness of their muscles particularly their muscles of respiration. So they might say they're short of breath and then also their proximal muscles. Um, you can see weakness of the cranial nerves and you can uh, get paralysis as well. Consciousness is not typically affected and then you don't usually see the muscarinic signs. So the reason this happens is not really clear, but the, the thought is that these patients had all this acetylcholine um, hanging out. And so then their nicotinic receptors were like, whoa, there's so much, there's so much acetylcholine, let's go away. So their nicotinic receptors downregulate. That's important because atropine will not work for them because atropine, as we'll talk about later, only works on muscarinic receptors. So if somebody comes in with this intermediate syndrome, proximal muscle weakness, shortness of breath, you can't, like atropine won't give them any, won't do anything for them. The usefulness of giving oxines like pralidoxime is unknown. So the treatment is really just supportive and a lot of patients will need intubation. Then the last thing that you can see is this organophosphate induced delayed polyneuropathy. It happens one or more weeks after they were exposed to the toxin. And it's been observed and documented for more than 100 years. Um, one study showed that it happened in 34% of patients. So it's pretty common. Usually happening like two to four weeks afterwards. These people, instead of the proximal muscle weakness and the shortness of breath, they are coming in with distal muscle weakness. So you might see like ascending paralysis, similar to like Guillain-Barre syndrome in their lower extremities. You also see pain and paresthesias. Um, also, consciousness is not usually affected in these patients. And it's not really clear why it happens. It's thought to be due to some inhibition of some enzyme. Um, again, not a cholinergic phenomenon. So the treatment is supportive. Uh, the good news is that it's often... Uh, complete recovery and without long-term sequelae. So now how do we diagnose these people with cholinergic, with, with uh, organophosphate toxicity? So of course our diagnosis is typically on clinical suspicion. So you have a patient that gives you some history that they ingested something or had some environmental exposure and then they have the classic symptoms. If you're not sure, though, then you can do blood tests. That you can measure in the blood. They are usually not available for you to um, immediately make a clinical decision on it. The important thing is if you're going to send these labs off, you have to cool the blood sample as soon as you collect it. Otherwise, it will not be accurate. So butyl cholinesterase, if you check this level, it does not relate to the severity of poisoning. It is just a sensitive marker of exposure. So if it is normal, and you say that they did not have an exposure to an organophosphate. In contrast to the acetylcholinesterase level, um, you can use it as a marker of how bad is the toxicity. So what I read was that activity levels more than 30% correlate to normal muscle function and no need for atropine. And then less than 10% is really bad and you need a lot of atropine. And between 10 to 30% is moderate and you still do need atropine, but it's not as much. So now, um, in order to break this uh, very pathology-heavy lecture, I'm going to show you some pictures 
that I took in Vietnam. <laughs> I've had an amazing time. It's been wonderful. Your country yeah. is absolutely gorgeous. I love it. So Where this, is it? Yeah. Is it? I don't know. This, this is this is in Halong <coughs> Bay. It's beautiful. It's called the Koi Bridge. The Koi Bridge. She trips around the Halong. Um, I did I did like a half day trip on a boat. Yeah. Okay, so here is um Hong Bay. Beautiful pagoda. Yep. So pretty, right? Yeah. This is uh this is like uh, they have a um what is it? I can't think of what it's called, where it takes you in the air and you get to you get to look over Hong Bay, like what they have in Switzerland. Very pretty. This is um, Hanoi. I will say, very exciting. This is the train street, which they have closed. Yeah. In Hanoi. Yeah. In Hanoi. Yeah, yeah, but they closed it. I was like, I mean, they should have, but they should have waited until I went there. Yeah, I got there, and then they were like, we closed it two weeks ago. Okay, but it's like it's dangerous. I know, I know, I know. I was like, okay, fine. Um, this is how. So I went with uh, Matt and Jane and um, Jonathan. There's some goats. You can't really see them in my picture, but a lot of goats on the beach. These are our motorbikes. I rode my first moped and I did not crash. That was good. And um, it poured down rain. Like I was drenched, absolutely drenched in, in rain. It was very fun though. Um, this is Fu Kwok. Wow. Very beautiful. I know. I'm pretty tired, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is. No, this is this is actually this is uh this is Hanoi. Yeah, Hanoi. It's a the um, temple of literature. The first. Yes, the first university. Yes. Here's us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know. Yeah, I have so many more, th so many like mm -hmm. other things to see in Vietnam. So I have to come back. The thing I do not like about Vietnam are these freaking yeah. monsters. <laughs> these spiders are huge. They're so big and terrifying. This one tortured me. I was in a grab. And it would like, it was outside the car, thankfully, but it would like pop up on this window and then it would pop on the other side of the window. It was like running across the car and then it would pop up in the front and then pop up in the back. And I was so scared to get out of the car. I typed in Google yeah. Translator to show the driver. I'm, I'm too scared to get out of the car. <laughs> and so then, and he killed it for me. So I, I swiped. This one is... It's so big. It, it, I think it eats birds. This was a, and it was absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. Terrifying. You just want to say hello to you. <laughs> no, I had nightmares, I think. Okay. But other than that, this is me saying I love Vietnam and I definitely want to come back someday for sure. Very beautiful. All right, back to the boring lesson. <laughs> So our management and our treatment, um, we have to stabilize patients, decontaminate patients, give drugs, and then there are some additional considerations. So stabilizing them, decompensation frequently results from respiratory compromise. Um, so we have to get a full set of vital signs on them right away, consider intubating them, ventilating them, um, and consider giving them IV fluids and pressors as needed. A lot of them need oxygen. If you have to intubate them, you do not want to use succinylcholine because it's a depolarizing paralytic. So again, it's like basically doing what the patient already has. Um, so you wanna use non-depolarizing agents like rocuronium. Um, the patient's 
often need ventilation for like seven to 15 days. Some require it for three weeks, so it's very long. Decontamination is next. So we have to protect ourselves for sure with full PPE, um, gloves, aprons, eye protection, splash protection. Um, and what I read was that neoprene and nitrile gloves and gown are needed because latex and vinyl are ineffective. We also should consider like a well ventilated space and frequently rotating staff so that one staff member does not get overexposed. We also need to remove the clothing of the patients and thoroughly wash their body with soap and water, which I'm sure is easier said than done. Um, and the other part of decontamination we talk about is gastric lavage. So a lot of hospitals do this, but there's no actual evidence that any form of de gastric decontamination benefits patients. If you're going to do it, which again, it doesn't show evidence that it works, but if you're going to, then you should only do it after the patient has been stabilized with oxygen, atropine, and pralidoxine. Um, Ipipac induced emesis is not recommended because the patient can become quickly unconscious and then you're increasing their risk of aspiration. You also should not give them a ton of water to induce um, emesis because you're just pushing the, the substance like further into their bowel and increasing the rate of absorption. So next we talk about pharmacologic agents. The most important is atropine and pralidoxine. Um, these are, we give these to um, like reverse the symptoms while waiting for the body to metabolize the substance. Atropine is only antimuscarinic, whereas pralidoxime is both antimuscarinic and antinicotinic. So the way atropine works is it blocks acetylcholine from binding to the muscarinic receptor. So acetylcholine is trying to get in there and atropine is like, nope, not today. This is my spot. Um, again, does not affect nicotinic receptors at all. Um, the goal is to give it early so that we reduce secretions and reduce bronchospasm. If you delay giving atropine, you can kill the patient and they can get cardiovascular collapse. So what happens when you give atropine? The first thing you will see resolve is sweating. One thing that you cannot rely on is reversal of um, their pupil constriction because it's delayed. And so you should not use that to guide your um, dosing. The goal of giving atropine is to achieve what's called atropinization, um, which is basically giving them enough atropine so that we restore their cardiopulmonary function and we dry their bronchial secretions. These are some target endpoints that you can use, but the most important thing is going to be drying their secretions. So as far as how much atropine do we give, there is no consensus on how on the dosing regimen. There's like 33 different regimens that you can do. So I don't know if you all use a different dose than what this says, um, but it sounds like there are many ways you can. The, the best thing to do though is to give boluses um, based on the evidence. So you want to give one to three milligrams of atropine bolus initially and then check your patient five minutes later. If they still have symptoms and that you have not achieved that atropinization, then you're going to double the dose. So if you gave them three milligrams initially, then you're giving them six milligrams five minutes later. Five minutes later, if they still have symptoms, then you're giving them 12 milligrams and et cetera. So then once you get to your goal, you start a drip and you start the drip at 10 to 20% of the dose that was required. Um, and then you can titrate this, which we'll talk about on the next slide. If the symptoms come back, despite them being on the drip, you can give more boluses of atropine. Um, and so this dosing regimen has been shown to reduce the mean time of atropinization from 152 minutes down to 24 minutes, and there was a huge reduction in mortality. So that's why I went with this one. So how do we know how to like adjust our drip dosing? The most important parameter to titrate the drip to, again, is your bronchorrhea. 
um, you have to watch out for atropine toxicity, which atropine toxicity is not as important in your acute, like your patient's dying, I have to give them boluses setting. But then once you get them to that level where they're stable on the drip, then you really have to worry about this. So if you start noticing that your patient's becoming tachycardic or they have dilated pupils or they develop a fever, then worry about atropine toxicity. Because